Hey, it's Sebastian Swick from Amazon Lit, and today I'm going to be sharing with you some insight into placing your first wholesale order. Uh, whether, let's say, you have no experience in e-commerce and are diving right into wholesale, or whether you do have experience through RA, retail arbitrage, OA, online arbitrage, or private label, and now you want to make a transition to wholesale, or maybe you just want an additional revenue stream to your already online business to make it a healthier business, right? A mixed portfolio. That's what it's about. So basically, this video is going to assume that you already have a wholesale supplier that you're working with. Uh, this is not about finding that right wholesale supplier. There are other videos that we provide that cover that topic. Uh, this is strictly about you already have that wholesale supplier, you've put together that first order, and now you wanna ensure that the products you're about to source are the correct products and that you have all the information, all the information needed before investing your money and having those products shipped to you. Let's start with the wholesaler, right? Let's uh, make sure that this is a legitimate wholesaler, uh, maybe local or national. And one of the key points of knowing whether a wholesaler is legit or not is the way that you had found that supplier, right? So if this was a supplier that you were put onto some sort of email blast and he's email blasting products to you, uh, by the hundreds or just a few products a day and setting minimum quantities on them that are astronomically higher than the ASIN uh, moves in a month, then you might want to look twice. Let's say um, we've had clients that we've worked with where um, these suppliers ask them to pay in Western Union or Bitcoin. Anything out of the ordinary is not somebody that you want to work with. Um, another red flag for a supplier is if that supplier provides ASINs. If that supplier is providing you with the ASINs to sell the product under, that is a red flag. Why would they not push it to one of their friends or sell it themselves on the marketplace. That is absolutely a red flag. Now remember, this does not mean that the supplier is not legit, but these sure are concerns and you should definitely question it more before moving forward. There are a lot of key factors that we're gonna need to look into when uh, looking at our product, right? So we discussed of what you don't want from a supplier. Let's say this is the right supplier and you have the products. Now let's make sure we have all the information needed. The proper assessment has been done before placing that order. Um, did you discuss shipping with the supplier? Meaning who's paying for shipping? Are you paying from shipping? Is shipping already included in the price that you're seeing or is shipping gonna be afterwards? So essentially, are you gonna pay this invoice and then they're gonna invoice you for shipping? Because that's gonna change the cost of your products and you're gonna to have to go back to Amazon and make sure it's profitable. How about if products are damaged during shipping? If products are damaged during shipping, who's responsible? If the supplier is shipping it themselves to you and they are paying for shipping, they're also going to be the ones that uh, handle the insurance on the shipping, right? So shipping insurance. Um, that's not all when it comes to shipping. Another factor you're going to have to look at when you ship is the discrepancies. Let's say products come in and they were damaged or there's something missing or maybe something was even shipped to you wrong. Those are discrepancies. How much time do you have to handle those discrepancies, to go through, make sure you received everything, and if there were any issues, how much time do you have to contact the supplier? Uh, some suppliers only have a 24-hour window, some have 72-hour windows or longer. And also, what does that window consider? Is it days or is it business days? A couple suppliers we work with, because they have customer service open on Saturday and Sunday, they consider Saturday and Sunday as a business day. So with only 48 hours to reply, if we got our order on a Friday, we would need to reply by Sunday at that same time that it was delivered. That's another factor you have to look at, right? How much time do you have to make a claim on the order? Let's step back one more time to shipping and let's look at also ETAs. How long is it gonna take for your product to arrive to you? 
Um, sometimes, you know, you can get it the next day. Certain suppliers, it could take two to three weeks or even longer. If they need to order that product from the manufacturer and then get it to you, it could take four, five, six weeks. The environment on Amazon can completely change and you need to have that information before placing that order. Estimated time of arrival or of delivery, depending on how you put it. Okay, so, so far what we got here is shipping, shipping insurance, time for a claim, and ETA. You put these here together, and this is the beforehand of the product, right? Of the product or products that you will be receiving. Next, we're gonna look at uh, the product and issues that might arise from the product that you ordered, sourced, right? So let's take a look at that. Number five or number one in this box is going to be UPC. Are you sure that that UPC correlates to the ASIN, the Amazon Standard Identification Number that identifies that product for that listing? Are you sure that's the UPC? Can you 100% confirm it? Or maybe they're even sending you to EAN. So do you even have UPCs from the supplier of the product you're getting? You need to confirm that, right? UPC, or is it EAN? In case you're unfamiliar, UPC is the barcode, EAN is the barcode on the product that correlates to that product. Universal Product Code or EAN, which is European Article Number. EAN would be 13 digits, UPC would be 12 digits. Ensure that the UPC is correct. What's next on our list here is what type of product this is, right? Is this a hazmat product? For those of you who are unfamiliar with what a hazmat is, it's a hazardous material product and that is basically noted by the DOT, the Department of Transportation. And if that is the case, this is going to cost you more money to ship. It might even be a, much of a more, more of a hassle uh, to ship this product out, right? You're going to have to ship it to hazmat approved fulfillment centers. And it's just going to cost overall more for the FBA fees, which we have a great video about fulfillment fees and calculating that. So make sure to check that out. Basically, it's going to change your profit. So make sure to look at whether it's a hazmat or not. Um, and the way you could do that, I'll show you right now. Okay, so here we are on the Seller Central homepage. What you're going to want to do once you log in or are on the homepage, you're going to want to go to the top towards the corner right here. You'll see a bar that says search, and that's your search bar. You're going to type in the word hazmat, hit enter, and then it's going to bring you to this screen over here. Okay, so here we are. We searched hazmat in the search bar and it brings us to this help page. Lots of great information here. Lots of insight into learning more about hazmat and what Amazon considers dangerous goods. We also have a phenomenal video out there in regards to any products that are considered hazmat and you believe they are not or you know they're not. How to uh, fill out an MSDS form and uh, essentially appeal that uh, hazmat claim. Okay, so anyways, let's get back to this. Let's look up an ace in here to see if it is in fact considered to be dangerous good. And this product that we're looking up, which is an aerosol, big sexy hair, uh, volume hairspray. This is in fact a dangerous goods product, meaning if we were to use Amazon's fulfillment network, we'd have to send it to a hazmat designated fulfillment center or hazmat enabled fulfillment center and that would cost us more to ship to that location and then from shipping from that location to the end customer would also cost us more as hazmats cost more to ship than your standard regular non-hazmat product all right number seven is uh oversize is this product an oversized product? And once again, if you're unfamiliar with what that is, please check out our other videos because we have all the information needed to look at the standard tiers uh, of sizing for FBA fulfillment fees. Oversize is one of them. Oversize is handled very, very differently from regular standard products. It gets sent to a oversized fulfillment center. It's gonna cost much more to ship to that center. It's gonna cost much more uh, from, to send it from that center to your customer when an order is being fulfilled. All right, and right here, these three here are the issues that can come up with the product itself. The next thing that we're gonna look at is the 
product listing and the ASIN performance. So I left a lot of room for that because there's a lot of mistakes that can happen and a lot of information that has to be taken in properly to ensure that you're ordering a profitable item and the correct item and that you're making a smart decision. When we look at a listing, basically, there's a few things that we're looking at. We're looking at its velocity. We're looking at its history. We're looking at the number of competitive sellers. We're gonna be also looking at the price, the current price is being sold at, that is. We're gonna look at the FBA fees, fulfillment costs plus referral fees. And we're also gonna be looking at different variations of that listing, whether it's a two pack, a bundle, or maybe the same ASIN that Amazon is selling online that might impact this ASIN that you're planning on selling on. Because yes, other ASINs on the platform will affect the performance of this ASIN that you're about to source. So the first one that I have that we look at when sourcing the correct product is velocity. Velocity is how much a month that product moves. Now, we're not only looking at how much a month that product moves, which by the way, you could get a lot of information on how much it moves through a lot of Chrome extensions that are available out there. You could also dive deeper and start uh, writing the ranking of a product and then watching its movement over time as you purchase products. But we're assuming that this is your first order, so you've never purchased for, for this ASIN, so you're not really quite sure how it moves. And if that's the case, you're gonna to want to use one of the Chrome extensions available for finding the velocity or the movement of a product. Basically, how much this ASIN moves a month. Just Google that, you'll find a few Chrome extensions that are available to you. So that is the velocity. First thing you're gonna to wanna to look at, how much that product moves a month. Now, once you know how much that product moves a month, I'm gonna dive down right to number of competitive sellers because this goes into my final equation for velocity and I'm taking that velocity and I'm dividing it by the competitive sellers plus myself since I'm gonna be one of those competitive sellers, right? So basically, the equation for figuring out velocity is ASIN movement per month and then we're gonna divide that by number of sellers plus myself, because I'm gonna be one of those sellers. So basically, if a product moves 200 a month, and there are three sellers on it, and then I include myself, four, I should be ordering 50 of that ASIN to supply me for a month period. Now if I wanna order two months worth, I'm ordering 100. If I wanna order six weeks worth, I'm ordering 75, so on, and so on. Now here is an important factor to take in because it's number of competitive sellers. I'm not looking at people who are selling this ASIN used. I'm not concerned with people that are selling this ASIN 25 plus percent higher than I am. I'm looking at the competitive sellers and that is how I am getting my velocity of 50, right? The next thing I'm gonna be looking at after velocity is history. So to get a better understanding of history, the um, software application that we use is Keepa. When I had uh, three of the category managers for Amazon in this office right here that I'm filming this video, when I had them here, one of the gentlemen that was the product category manager for health and beauty, uh, he was showing me one of the ASINs that we sell on his laptop. He turned it around and he had Keepa on there. I was already informed about Keepa and the benefits of Keepa, but I didn't understand how saturated it was in the market. So saturated that even Amazon employees, Amazon managers were using it. And when I said, you use Keepa? He said, of course I do. What else would we use? So Keepa is key. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Keepa, we do have other videos out there that really dive into that. But right now, we're just going to stick to our first wholesale order. That's what this video is about. But I am going to tell you which areas that you need to look at inside of Keepa to make an informative decision. So when you're looking at the history of the ASIN and you're viewing it through Keepa, there's a few factors that you're going to want to look at. You're going to want to look at the average rank of the product, right? Because when I'm deciding this ASIN movement, 
when I decide how much that ASIN moves, I'm not looking at just for today. Just for today is not enough data. It's not enough information to make an informative decision. I've seen too many people that we've consulted before, too many sellers make that mistake where they see that, oh wow, this ACE is moving 500 a month, but it's just for today, it's just for tomorrow, it's maybe because of a coupon happening right now. Uh, there's so many reasons. It could just be a seasonal thing. Regardless of what it is, we never look at a day. We look at 90 days worth of information and that's where keeping the histograph comes so in handy. So we're looking at 90 days and getting that 90 day average. That is in Keepa. It will actually show you the 90 day rank average of the ASIN. So I'm looking at that. Another thing I'm looking at during that 90 day period is the average price. It doesn't show you the average price, but it shows you different buy box points. And through that, you can kind of look at the 90 day flow and decide on what, what is that median price? Because that's another big mistake I see with sellers is they see the price has skyrocketed for the day or maybe just for the week and they buy in thinking it's gonna be super profitable and then it tanks and it happens all the time. It happens all the time and it's because they didn't properly read the charts they thought they saw an opportunity that wasn't there. They were impatient, they jumped on it, and now they've, they're losing money, and they're losing their hard-earned money, their invested money, and their newer sellers, or been around not too long, where every penny really counts, it can really affect and impact the future of their business, and it's all because they didn't read Keepa and look at the average price or the average rank. So please take that into consideration when you're purchasing products. Another thing you're gonna to want to look at when you're buying a product on Keepa is whether Amazon sells the product. If Amazon sells the product, one thing you're gonna to wanna to look at is if they share the buy box. We go into more information on that in our Instagram close friends. I'm not trying to sell you anything, it just it is what it is, but we will be providing further insight into that in the future on YouTube. We just don't have that content drop now. But if you want some more information, check us out on IG, DM us uh, on Facebook right here. You can ask those questions. But we are looking whether Amazon sells it, and not only if they sell it, but are they not sharing that buy box? A lot of times, believe it or not, we must, we probably have over, I'd say 60 plus listings, 60 plus ASINs that we sell on, that Amazon sells on, that we're selling our product because Amazon is not competing for that buy box. Why? I can't provide you that information. Only thing I can tell you is that they're not and it's based off of reading these charts correctly and knowing what we're getting into before we do. So if Amazon is sharing the buy box, then it's a check, another reason for me to buy the product. Another thing I wanna look at is the number amount of FBA sellers on that listing. If there's only one FBA seller on that listing, it's a well-moving listing, and that FBA is the brand, that FBA seller is the brand, well, that's gonna make me think twice before purchasing. Uh, they might have EBC, enhanced brand content, and essentially have the trademark for that listing, and if you purchase and try to sell under that listing, they might put an IP claim against your account. And if you're a new seller, that could be the end of your account. Your account could be suspended or the ASIN could be suspended and you could be stuck with tons of product not knowing how to get rid of it. So please be on the lookout and make sure to check the number of FBA sellers. If it's too good to be true, unfortunately, you guys know what happens there. It probably is. All right, so we've covered velocity. We've covered history, we've covered the number of sellers, and based on all this information here, I'm able to come up with the amount of product I'm going to purchase, right? I'm taking all this information, I'm uh, dividing it and figuring out my monthly quantity that I'm gonna be selling based on the history and based on all the current information I found here, and then I can place my order for however many months or however many days I plan on selling it, right? The next is FBA fees. Make sure you're using a Chrome extension calculator or you're going right to the Seller Central FBA URL and checking the FBA fees for the product you're going to sell. If you're brand new, FBA fees are essentially the fulfillment fees, the shipping, the packaging, the handling, everything that encompasses Amazon taking your product from the fulfillment center and shipping it to the customer. 
The other part of this FBA fee is the referral fee, which basically Amazon says, hey, we've given you this amazing platform. We've advertised enough where we have hundreds of millions of prime members making it easy for you to sell that product. Well, we want to charge you a referral fee for all the services that we provide. That referral fee fluctuates, but it's typically 15%. Now let's go back to FBA fees. Um, many might not be aware, but FBA fees change semi-annually and referral fees can fluctuate on that same ASIN. There could even be referral fee discounts, which you would need to look up in your seller central just type in referral fee discounts in the search bar and you might be surprised that there might be ASINs that you're currently selling that have referral fee discounts that could be applied and you're missing out on you don't know how often we take advantage of this and we see other sellers selling for two three dollars higher and we know why and it's simply because they don't know there's a referral fee discount right now for that ASIN we're gonna take the price that it's selling at right the average price we're gonna minus the FBA fees we're going to minus the referral fees. We're going to minus the shipping to Amazon, the cost of us shipping to Amazon, because a lot of people forget to include that as well. And then they find that what they thought was profitable is now a loss or a break even. So shipping to Amazon. And then we're going to include our COGS, our cost of goods. How much should we pay for the product? And this has to include shipping if the supplier charged us for the shipping, right? So COGS has to include shipping. Uh, we go even a little step further, which is the packaging, the tape, uh, the labor, all that, all that kind of goes into uh, our, our net later on. But right now, we're gonna just stick to this simple formula here to get your gross profit or your operating profit, your Amazon operating profit. And the way that we do that one more time is to take the price, the average price, not the price it's currently selling at, minus the FBA fees, the referral fee, the shipping to Amazon Fulfillment Center of your goods, the actual cost of goods, and include the shipping from the supplier to your facility if there was a shipping charge on that product. And what you're left with is your operating making sure you guys can see it. Not that you could read it, I'm sure, but you could see it. Is your operating profit. I hope you're taking notes. I hope you play this video back because this is how you are gonna make sure that the product you are selling or going to sell is profitable. So you can repeat these processes over and over again, begin that snowball effect and start growing a healthy e-commerce wholesale inspired business. So let's break it down again, basically everything that we went through today to make sure that the products or products that you're going to purchase are sourced correctly. So that way you can repeat this process, rinse, wash and repeat over and over again and expect to gain the same results. Shipping. Who's paying for shipping? Are you paying for shipping or is the supplier paying for shipping? This is something you need to ask and something you need to take into account when calculating your operating profit. It can take you from having a great product to having a mediocre or maybe even having a negative impacting product. Shipping insurance. Basically, if something goes wrong during transit, who's at fault? Is the supplier going to handle it or do you have to handle it? That is something you need to ask and is critical. Typically for us, the supplier handles it. You'll know if the supplier is handling it, if the shipping is included and he's the one that's providing the transportation. If not, then you're going to have to ask. Time for claim. What if something goes wrong while you're receiving, like uh, the product's damaged or there's something missing or maybe the wrong product was sent? How much time do you have to contact the distributor or supplier to ensure that you're credited for those discrepancies? ETA, what's the expected time of arrival of your goods after you pay? Is it going to arrive tomorrow, two, three, four days? Or does the supplier distributor need to order this product from the manufacturer and it's not going to arrive to you five to six weeks because it's on back order? UPC EAN. This one's a little bit more tricky to make sure and ensure that the product you're ordering is the correct product. 
because sometimes the ASIN, well, the UPC for that ASIN that shows on that listing might not necessarily be the manufacturer UPC, but that doesn't mean it's inaccurate. You're going to need to look at the images, see if the UPC shows on the image. You're gonna to have to look at packaging to ensure it's correct, the weight, the size, the count. You need to take all those factors in when making your buying decision to ensure that you are purchasing the correct ASIN. Is this product hazmat? Is it oversized? If it is, the shipping to Amazon and the shipping from Amazon to the customers when they make a purchase is going to be impacted by whether it's a hazmat or oversized and essentially it's going to cost you more. So you need to take that into account when looking at your operating profit. Velocity. How much does a product move a month? Now remember to look at 90 day average velocity and base it on the ranking. There are plenty of sites that can give you estimated sales based on ranking. There's also lots of Chrome extensions out there that will help you to find the estimated average for that 90 day period or whether it's a month's period and then you divide and multiply by however many days you want to be selling that product, right? History. I just talked about 90 days because for us that's really what we're looking at. We need to have at least 90 days of information to get an accurate estimate of how the product's going to move. I mean, we're also looking at the seasonality, right? Obviously, we're not going to be buying water supply products, pool supply products in September because we see how great it moved in August and July. So you have to take that into account, but you're going to want to, you have to look at history to get accurate information about the product. You don't want to just look at it for today because that's not enough data and that information, these products fluctuate just like stocks do so you really have to take a average and have a nice chunk of data for us it's 90 days competitive sellers how many sellers are you going to be competing with on this listing is it too saturated for the velocity I mean is there 25 sellers on it and the products only moving 50 a month is it really worth it for you to take all this time to move two products a month to move two ASINs worth a month. So you really gotta look at the competitive sellers. How about the price? Same thing goes with the 90 day average. We're looking at the average history for that price. Well, the average price is history rather. And based on that information, we're gonna take the FBA fees into account and all the different fees, including the cost of goods into account, starting at that average price to see if this is profitable. FBA fees and referral fees. These are the cost of shipping the product from the fulfillment center to the customer. You need to take these into account with the price to get a nice estimate of what your operating profit is going to be. Now you might have other expenses as we do. We put those in later. Those are our own operating uh, expenses versus our Amazon operating expenses and the combination of both is what gives us net profit. Last but not least, other ASINs. You need to look at other ASIN, the variations of that same product to see if maybe another listing is going to negatively impact that ASIN or positively impact and give you an opportunity for a plan B, a plan C, or better yet, to sell on all three listings. So I really hope the information that I provided is going to inspire, teach, really just help anyone who's in the fog about any area that I covered today to, to get out of it. And, and these are the same techniques that we use here to grow an eight-figure business that's done over a hundred million dollars just on Amazon. Not, not including the other marketplaces we sell on, not including wholesale, but just on Amazon. I'm telling you, I was probably just like you. I was in the basement. I knew nothing about Amazon where I started, when I started, and I've been able to learn uh, from others and learn through experience all the things that I've shown you today and pass them on to my staff and now passing them on to you. Just stay watching the videos that we're gonna keep dropping, the content that we're dropping. Just a disclaimer for all the other gurus that you see, please, before you take on another course, ask them a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Get on the phone with them. 
Eric and myself, we do live streams where they're throwing questions at us. If somebody is claiming they know this information, then they should be able to spit it off the top of their tongue because they live it. If they can't, I would step back, not waste my money. There's plenty of information out there from real people that are really selling on Amazon that can help you. That's my two cents spiel. I hope somebody got something out of this. Stay lit.